Hello and welcome again to another presentation of Profit from Profits, where prophecy speaks and prosperity follows. No, I'm not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet, but I believe in the prophets. As the Bible says, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe in his prophets, so shall you prosper. Mm -hmm. Before we get into today's lesson, let's pray. Father in heaven, may your grace speak, may your word speak, and may your prophet speak as well. May your Holy Spirit bring us into union of faith and power and also into the rebuking of evil among your people in Jesus name. Amen. Friends, today we're going to be talking about a subject um, that I feel is getting worse in the church. It's getting worse in the church. Men made gods and it is the curse in Adventist leadership. Men are becoming like little popes, little priests, running around, barring people from speaking, barring people from Adventists in good standing, no less. Adventists in good standing, barring them from speaking because of some disagreement. Let's take a look. What does the Spirit of Prophecy say? A warning against making men as gods. Brethren, what does she say? The high-handed power that has been developed as though position has made men gods, makes me afraid and ought to cause fear. It is a curse wherever and by whosoever it is exercised. Now, what are some of the principles that we get from what Sister White is saying here? That this power has been developed. That is, it has developed over time. It hasn't come overnight. But through successive months and years, and decades, it has developed within the Seventh Adventist Church that men are making themselves gods. And this attitude is a curse. And specifically, it's a curse among leadership. Because they are the ones that affect everyone else. Leadership affects everyone else. And they are the ones who especially need to guard against making themselves little popes and little gods. Let's take a look a little bit as a refresher for those little gods and little popes, what did Jesus say about Christian leadership? Authentic Christian leadership. What did Jesus, those who those men made gods are supposed to be following, what did he say about Christian leadership? But Jesus called unto him, called them unto him, that's his disciples, and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them and they that are great exercise authority upon them that is there is an active element in the gentile method of leadership in which authority and dominion is lorded and exercised over others that jesus says but it shall not be so among you but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. That is what Jesus said. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. This is what Jesus said. Jesus never made a pope. The papacy is a demonic creation. It is overbearing. It is violent. It is against Jesus. It is Antichrist. Jesus never made a pope. There is no room in the Bible for a pope. And there is no room in the Bible for men who are saying that they are leaders within the Seventh Adventist Church and acting like the Gentile system, which is to exercise dominion and authority. What they should be exercising is servanthood and ministering. And these things are diametrically opposite to what's been going on in some of the conferences within the Seventh Adventist Church. And these conferences need to be brought to heel. They need to be rebuked. And it is only because of the weakness of the GC not enforcing the rules like they should be that this is happening. This is what's going on. The whole system is becoming rotten. 
I'm not talking about the church. The church is not Babylon. That's not what I'm saying. Because people are going to say, oh, he's, he's against the church. I'm not against the church. God is not against the church. God rebukes those whom he loves. But the, the conferences, the pastorate, is becoming like little popes. They're becoming like men-made gods. The Bible says, Give a shepherd's care to God's flock among you, exercising oversight, not merely as a duty, but willingly under God's direction, not for shameful profit, but eagerly. That is not for money. Pastors should get paid. Conference workers should get paid. But that's not the purpose of their work. It's not money. It's exercising oversight and being under God's direction to take care of God's flock willingly, not for money. And do not lord it over those entrusted to you, but be examples of the flock then. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that never fades away. Leaders have the power of oversight. They are to look to the health and well-being of their flock. And to carry out proper church discipline, which has to happen at times under the inspiration and the Spirit of God. But that authority is not to be dictatorial. It's not through force or violence, and it's not through coercion of conscience. The end goal of such authority is not submission to authority. It's the salvation of the soul. This is what is being lost. This coercive spirit, the spirit of Antichrist, is pervading the world. You must do this. You must be like this. You must take this into your body. You must allow your children to be exposed. To men who pretend to be women. This is the spirit of Antichrist. Where there's no discussion. Only coercion. And this is invading our church. On Fulcrum 7, which is a website that holds, I would say, more conservative views. You can find the particulars of the issues that we'll be discussing. And specifically, I want to talk about what has been happening in the Potomac Conference, for some of the viewers, some of my viewers that may not be aware, of what's been happening in that conference with regards to speakers that are allowed or disallowed, events that are allowed or disallowed, and what is the result. As you can see here, this article from Fulcrum 7, and I urge you to go to Fulcrum 7 and take a read at their articles. They're very good. You don't have to agree with everything everybody says. You can read in the comments. Not everyone agrees always. But it's a good place to get information of what's going on in the church. Also, Advent Messenger is also a good place to go. But I don't have them up on, on this side. But in any case, the Potomac Conference, which is in Virginia, United States, cancels conservative speaker while approving a pro-LGBT symposium. And one of the speakers in that LGBT symposium claims that Jesus was queer. So the Potomac Conference is okay with having this type of material presented at their churches, but it's not okay to have Pastor Stephen Bohr, who is a credentialed Seventh-day Adventist minister in good standing, it's not okay to listen to Pastor Stephen Bohr but it's okay to listen to Jesus is queer, or Jesus was queer. This is what Ellen White was warning us against with regards to men-made gods. Because they're not even applying, this, these conferences are not even applying their principles, their so-called adherence to, to the policies of the church manual, they're not applying them properly. It's always a rule for thee, but not for me. They exempt themselves from the rules when it is convenient for them. That's what they're doing. So this is the this is an article on April 13th, 2023 on Fulcrum 7. You can go read it. You can see the particulars. But the Potomac Conference sent a letter to the Roanoke Church in Virginia that they should disinvite Pastor Stephen Bohr 
who is again a pastor in good standing, Seventh-day Adventist minister in good standing, and yet the Potomac Conference says nothing, and in fact encourages the Jesus was queer symposium, or whatever whatever the symposium was called. But this particular gentleman that's invited there claims that Jesus was queer. That's disgusting. It's disgusting. It's perverse. It's demonic. But that's what the Potomac Conference supports. So think about that, brethren, when you support the conference. I'm sorry, but there is a point. Don't make the excuse, oh, God will fix everything at the front. God will fi fix things at the front, but he's going to fix things at the back end too. And if we continue to throw our support to this kind of evil, God will account us with the evil. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. The head will get cut off and so will the tail. So that the body can remain. You understand what I'm saying? In this, in this particular article, we see the reasons why the conference disliked Pastor Bohr. This is again the article in Fulcrum 7. You can read it. Pastor Bohr, he is in agreement with the World Seventh-day Adventist Church in regards to women's ordination. Bohr also believes in the biblical distinction between male and female. These are things that not only our church has voted for, but what the Bible supports. And because the Potomac Conference is in rebellion with these ideas, they are allowing Jesus was queer and disallowing Pastor Stephen Bohr. You don't have to agree with everything Pastor Bohr says. I may not agree with everything Pastor Bohr says. That's not the point. The point is this men-made God's mentality, this papal mentality that is spreading in the conferences like a curse and a plague. This is what's happening. Pastor Bohr believes that our task and duty is to help people get ready for the second coming of Jesus, a teaching scornfully derided as last generation theology. It doesn't matter that the Advent movement has taught this from, its inse from our inception. The Adventist church has taught that there will be a last generation upon the earth, that they will fulfill the gospel commission to live righteously before God just before the second coming. And the problem is in the church that people don't believe we can overcome sin anymore. They don't believe in perfection of character. The Bible speaks of perfection of character. Yes, we are supposed to have perfect characters before God, before he returns. Yes, we do. It's absolutely clear. We've taught this from the beginning of Seventh-day Adventists. And Seventh-day Adventists who hate this message, who hate this idea, are not Seventh-day Adventists. You can't be. Go be a Baptist. Go be a Baptist. Go be a Lutheran. Go be a Catholic. Go be an atheist, a Muslim. It doesn't matter. Go be something else. Because you're not an Adventist. You're not a Seventh-day Adventist if you don't believe that you can overcome sin. You're not even a Christian. The Potomac Conference administration believes that they alone possess the discernment to determine if a speaker like Bohr is safe to listen to. Common church members are not informed or biblically astute enough to judge these members. This is what Potomac Conference President Charles Tapp is telling this church, the Roanoke Church. You're too stupid to know the difference between truth and error. That's basically what he said. You have to let us decide for you what's truth and what's error. This is as papal as a spirit as there ever has been in the Seventh Adventist Church. This is demonic. This is Antichrist. This is the spirit of the Pope in the church. The Lord rebuked these men. And I know he will. I know he will. He's going to do it because God will have a pure church and a pure ministry. And unless these men change, they will not see Jesus in peace. They will not see and will not meet Christ in peace when he returns. But it gets worse. It's not just about the Potomac Conference sending letters. The Potomac pastor threatens to dissolve the Gatesburg Church Board for inviting Bohr to speak there. So this is another church in the Potomac Conference. And this pastor threatened to dissolve the church board, which he doesn't have the power to do, for inviting Stephen Bohr to speak there. 
Now they're going to dissolve the church. They want to dissolve the church board. And by dissolving the church board, they can dissolve the church. That's what they want. They want to bring you to heal. Is this authority? Is this the type of authority that Jesus was speaking about? Is this the type of, of attitude that Christ was talking about? And it gets worse. Gaysburg pastor enters church and takes electronic equipment away. This church, the Gaysburg church, was renting this building. And the pastor came in while the church members were away in a different place worshiping. The pastor comes in, allegedly, and takes all of this material, all the uh, electronic equipment, the camera, the sound system, and whatnot, takes it and confiscates it. And then, friends, it gets worse. The Gatesburg SCA bank account of $180,000 is taken from them. So then someone took their money. Someone took their money. You can look at the particulars on the F7, Fulcrum 7 website, and you can look for these articles. This one's August 12th. This one's August 6th, so I don't have the date for this one. But you can look up the articles, and you can find the particulars there. But I think what's necessary is a lesson on how to be a Christian. Lessons for the Potomac Conference and pastors. Now, if I was a pastor of the Potomac Conference, I'd be ashamed. I would be, I would be ashamed of my conference president. I'd be ashamed of my conference, and I would rebuke them sharply. Are there any, are there any righteous men left in Potomac? I don't know. There may be some. I'm not saying they're all bad. But here's a lesson. What does the Bible say? When thou dost lend thy brother anything, thou shalt not go into his house to fetch his pledge. Thou shalt stand abroad, and the man to whom thou didst lend shall bring out the pledge abroad unto thee. What is the principle here? The principle is that even if the conference owns the materials, the, the electronic equipment that the Potomac pastor, Potomac conference pastor took out, the bank account, even if they own these things, this is how they should have acted. Thou shalt not go into his house and fetch his pledge. This is the principle. I know we don't live under the civil and ceremonial laws of ancient Judaism. We don't. But we live under the principles of them. If you wanted it back, you should have asked for it back first. Just because you have the legal right to do things doesn't have a, mean you have a moral right to do things. And in the judgment, what do you think God is going to do? Do you think he's going to judge you by the laws of the land or the laws of of the heavenly kingdom. Pastor, Potomac Conference President, Charles Tapp, what do you think he's going to do? Do you think you're going to be able to hide your heart from God? You ministers out there acting like popes, do you think you're going to be able to hide your heart from God? You can't hide from God. God knows where you live. God knows what you think. God knows what you say. God knows what you desire. God knows what's in your heart. He knows your motives and he judges you on that day. Right now, you have the opportunity to turn. Turn from your wicked ways. But if you will not, God will bypass you. He will go around you and he will leave you behind. He will take his spirit from you and put it in someone else. That's what he was going to do. You know, friends, I'll share with you something here. In this conference, the British Columbia Conference in Canada, British Yukon Conference, I was told I'm not allowed to speak in the churches here because of my Sunday Law Update sermon, in which I spoke about COVID issues from the pulpit. And Brad Thorpe, the conference president here, came to my house and I spoke with him. And he said that he gathered all the pastors of the BC Yukon Conference and told them they are not to say anything about COVID from the pulpit. 
they are forbidden to speak about it. Now, I didn't know that at the time because I'm not a local pastor and I wasn't at that meeting. And so here I pop up a couple weeks later talking about COVID issues from the front. God knew. God said, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let you silence this. I'm going to go around you, Brad. I'm going to go around you. I'm going to take a man who doesn't know anything about this and I'm going to put my spirit in him and I'm going to preach and I'm going to teach the people and the warnings that the issues around COVID bring, the moral issues, the ethical issues, the issues with regards to coercion of conscience, I'm going to use that man and he's going to go around you. My spirit I'm going to take from you. God is going to take his Holy Spirit from the men who are dumb dogs and will not bark. He will take it from them and he will put it in others. Others who may not have a theological degree, who may not have a degree in, in, or can't speak Greek or Hebrew. God will put that spirit in children and they will preach the gospel more, with more power than all of those who spent years learning and never had Christ in their heart. God is going to shake this church, brethren. He's going to shake it. He's going to shake it hard. And nothing that is chaff will remain. Not one particle, not one mite, not one tear is going to remain. It's not up to us to handle the tears. But it is up to us to withstand this wickedness and not be part of it. God is going to sweep through his people. God is preparing his people for the second coming. Jesus wants to come back and wants to take his people home. He wants to end this. And he's going to end it. He's going to end it, but we have to be on his side, brethren. Those who are in power those leaders, those ministers, those elders, those church boards, those professors, those doctors, those conference leaders, general conference leaders, wherever you are. God is calling you to repentance and to have the spirit of meekness of Jesus. Yes, there will be discipline. Yes, discipline must happen in a church. I totally agree. But what is happening here is not discipline. This is Romanism. It's not, it's not Christian. It's Romanism. This is a spirit of Antichrist, what's happening. You have an opportunity to repent. And I wish that you would. I really wish that you would. What a praise it would be to say, you know what? You know what, brethren? I, I, we made a mistake. We made a mistake in how we dealt with this, and, and we're sorry. No one would hate you for that. People would be happy for that. They would say, wow, look, that's Christian. Admitting that they were wrong, admitting that, that they that they erred, and coming back together in love, that would be Christian. Then you would get support, but not this. If you continue in this, only scorn, only scorn and more scorn will be heaped upon your own head. Adventists are turning Catholic, brethren. We have Adventists turned Catholic. Ellen White said in this vision, first testimonies, what did she say? That night I dreamed that I was in Battle Creek, looking out from the glass, or side glass at the door, and saw a company marching up to the house, two and two. They looked stern and determined. I knew them well. He's ravenous. I knew them well. And turned to open the parlor door to receive them, but I thought I would look again. Something was off. The scene was changed. The company now presented the appearance of a Catholic procession, one borne his hand across and another a reed, and as they approached, the one carrying a reed made a circle around the house, saying three times, The house is proscribed. The goods must be confiscated. They have spoken against our holy order. I wept and prayed much as I saw our goods confiscated. This is a vision Ellen White had. It's a strange vision. What does it mean? What it means, brethren, is that Adventist leadership is becoming Catholic. It's becoming Catholic in its spirit. It's becoming Catholic in its deportment and what it does and how it acts. Myself, I'm told I can't speak 
in the churches. I'm not under censure. Only the local church can censor me. But they don't even follow their own rules. They only follow the rules when it supports their agenda. They'll quote, oh, the manual or this policy. But they'll ignore the policy or the manual if it goes, if it goes according to their agenda. Then it doesn't matter. So you know what? Take your policy. Take your manual. And shred it. Because you've made it mean nothing. Therefore, it should mean nothing to us. The only manual and the only policy that the church should have now is the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. That's it. Because Lord knows you're not following that. But that isn't to be burned. That is the foundation of our faith. Ellen White warned us. The goods must be confiscated. They have spoken against our holy order. This is why the house is prescribed. The house is proscribed because they've spoken against the holy order. And so they will confiscate the goods. They've, Pastor Bohr speaks against having female pastors. And the mixing of genders. And the Bible speaks of it. The Bible says exactly what the Brother Bohr is saying on these issues. And they don't like it. The church, the general conference, even voted several times that there are to be no ordained female pastors. And yet there are churches and conferences in rebellion that are ordaining women. And yet these conferences and pastors and, and churches are not being rebuked. Proper church discipline is not being administered. And what is happening here to the in the in the Roanoke Church, in the Gatesburg Church, by the Potomac Conference, is not proper church discipline. It's Romanism. That's what it is. In this article, Ellen White gives us some very, very salient advice. And I'm going to read this. It's, it's a bit lengthy. But we're going to draw some principles out of this, brethren. We're going to draw some principles out of this because we need to. Members, members, you as a member of the Seventh-day Adventist body, you have both a privilege and a duty to stand up against this type of tyranny. They may toss you out of the synagogue for standing up. They may toss you out of the synagogue for standing up. But Jesus said that that would happen. And he said, happy are ye when they do this. Friends, if you're out there sitting in these churches, and these churches are promoting every vile thing, Jesus is not in that church. I'm telling you right now, he is not in that church. Jesus is not in conferences that promote vileness. Things that are an abomination to God. It's time for us to take a stand as laity, as members, and say no more. We will not listen to this. We will not take part in it. It's time to make a decision. Because you will not be saved just because you follow your pastor. In fact, many people will be lost. Most people will be lost because they followed the pastor. Because most people don't realize that the spirit of Romanism, the satanic coercive spirit is spreading amongst nearly all leadership across the world. And that coercive spirit is going to be used to bring in the mark of the beast. And people are going to say, well, my pastor says this or that, so I'm going to believe it. What is that kind of a response among Seventh-day Adventists? We're people of the book, not people of the priest. Wake up, people. It's time to stir up righteous indignation against such actions. In love, in truth, in righteousness. Without violence, without violence, but with authority of Jesus Christ. Just because you're not a pastor doesn't mean you don't have authority in Jesus Christ. 
You have authority in Jesus Christ. We are all brethren. That's what the Bible says. Remember what Jesus says. Your minister is supposed to be your servant, not your slave master. Now, what does she say? Before I go too far afield, what does she say? The holy principles that God has given are represented as sacred fire. Okay? But common fire has been used in place of the sacred. Plans contrary to truth and righteousness are introduced in a subtle manner. So in a subtle manner, in her day, conferences were introducing methods and ways in a subtle manner on the plea that this must be done and that must be done because it is for the advancement of the cause of God. We're doing this for Jesus. We're oppressing the people for Jesus. It's good if one man die for the nation. Pharaoh must have thought it was a good idea to kill all the firstborn. Lots of things are done because they think it's a good idea. And it ends up being horrible evil. But it is the devising of men that leads to oppression, injustice, and wickedness. The cause of God is free from every taint of injustice. It can gain no advantage by robbing the members of the family of God of their individual rights. To you conference leaders, deans of universities, you pastors, you union presidents, division presidents, GC presidents, God's people have rights. And the Potomac Conference is trampling on those rights right now. They are sustaining vile practices in the promotion, in allowing the promotion of LGBT material that is sweeping the churches, sweeping the world, supporting that, and actively suppressing Adventist pastors, in good standing no less, that would speak the truth to the people. And the GC and the BRI and Loma Linda and ADCOM committee headed by Ted Wilson has been trampling the rights when you signed those vaccine documents. When you signed away the rights of Seventh-day Adventists and you took away our religious liberty by the documents that you signed, that you wrote and pasted on the internet. Don't look at me. I'm not the one. I'm not the, one, the, the disturber of Israel. It's you. It's you. You're disturbing Israel by your sins. You're disturbing Israel by all your pronouncements with climate change and vaccines and all these other things. Aligning the church with things that we have nothing to do with. This is all on you. And it will fall on you. At the end of days. Robbing members of the family of God of their individuality or their rights. God is watching you. He is marking you, leadership. And you should be quaking and trembling right now. Now I know. It's not easy to be a leader in God's church. God's people can be stubborn. We can be stubborn. Stiff-necked. We can be difficult to handle. But is this going to make it any better? Is coming in and taking all the equipment and telling them that they're going to disband the church because they're listening to a pastor who preaches the things that our church has taught, is that making it better? You want gospel mercy? You show it first. You're paid to do it. You're eating from the holy tithe. You're eating from the holy tithe. You're paid to be a Christian, to be kind and loving and understanding and forgiven, forgiving. You're paid for that. I don't think uh, I don't think the church is getting its money's worth. I don't think it's getting its. I don't think God is getting his money's worth. God's people have rights before the Lord, and you're trampling them. She goes on to say, "The great and holy and merciful God will never be in league with dishonest practices. Not a single touch of injustice will He vindicate. He's not vindicating you in heaven right now, Potomac Conference." GC, he's not vindicating you in heaven. That's a, that's a big deal. You should really consider that. Men have taken unfair advantage of those who they suppose to be under their jurisdiction. 
They were determined to bring the individuals to their terms. They would rule or ruin. Satan's methods tend to one end, to make men the slaves of men. And here's Charles Tapp, president of the conference in Potomac, telling people to listen with love to LGBT. Listen with love to LGBT. Well, how about listening with love to Pastor Bohr? You're a hypocrite, sir. You are a hypocrite. And Jesus has nothing but the greatest rebuke for hypocrites. Whited sepulchers. White on the inside, but inside full of dead men's bones. You're full of death inside. Brother, you got to repent. You have to turn this around. You are not going to be saved. You are not going to be saved. Telling people to listen with love on the one hand to perversion and on the other hand disbarring a pastor who's speaking the truth. The high-handed power that has been developed as though a position has made men gods makes me afraid and not to cause to fear. It is a curse wherever and by whosoever it is exercised. This lording it over God's heritage will create such a disgust of man's jurisdiction that a state of insubordination will result. Friends, do you understand what she's saying? The people are learning that men in high positions of responsibility cannot be trusted to mold and fashion other men's minds and characters, the result will be a loss of confidence even in the management of faithful men. But the Lord will raise up laborers who realize their own nothingness without special help from God. What she is saying is that we in the church are going to see a state in which there is going to be insubordination. And even in the management of faithful men. Now faithful men you're, this is a this is a trial for you, because what's happening is you pastors, and you conferences, that are faithful, that are doing the work, you out there, that ministers, doctors, and uh, teachers in our schools, you that are faithful and doing the work are going to be affected by the unfaithfulness and the unchristian papal spirit of your co-workers you're going to be affected by it but god is going to raise up others that are going to help you the ones that are making your life harder god is going to put aside and god will raise up others that were going to help you they're going to they're going to hold the hands of moses you know what i'm saying when joshua and aaron held the hands of moses friends if there are if there are ministers and there are conferences where you are and they are loyal to God. Hold up their hands. Pray for them. Work with them. Make their job easier. Because their job is hard enough already. Uplift the hands of Moses when you need to. But sometimes you have an Eli and not a Moses. And an Eli and an Aaron need to be rebuked to their face. Lest they be lost. It's not out of hate. It's not out of hate. It's out of love. Because no one else is telling. See, they're surrounded by people that tell them yes all the time. And that gets to a man. That gets to him. He starts thinking that he's God. Don't be a yes man. If you have a, if, if you have a close contact with a pastor or a minister, a conference president, don't be their yes man. Tell them the truth in love, but tell them the truth in order to save their soul. We can't be afraid of position. Position doesn't make a pastor God. That's not God. He blows his nose. He sweats. He has to take a shower and go to the bathroom like everyone else. He's not a God. It's a man. Might be a godly man. And that needs to be respected. But he's still just a man. Jesus is God. No man is God. Do you understand, brethren? Seventh-day Adventists out there, your pastors are not priests. They're not priests. They're men that need your prayers and need your support when they're doing good. And when they're doing wrong, they still need your support in helping them to turn. But if they will not turn, stop listening to them. 
because they're going to lead you astray. The Lord will raise up laborers who realize their own nothingness without the special help from God. These are men from the plow, from the fields, from the mechanics. These are lumberjacks. These are computer technicians, accountants. They don't have theological degrees, but they have an unction from the Spirit of God. God is going to call them. God is calling them now and preparing them to take your place. So if you don't want your place taken, Porter Mac Conference president, you don't want your place taken, you don't want your crown removed, then pay attention. Because God is prepping people to do that. Friends, we don't want to move in a state of insubordination to God. We don't want to lose faith in faithful men. God is going to replace these miscreants with faithful men. God is going to do the replacing. But we also as a church, as laity, have a responsibility to make sure that those who we vote into office and church boards and elders are righteous. That's the responsibility of the laity. Furthermore, she says, the spirit of domination is extending to the presidents of our conferences. If a man is sanguine of his own powers and seeks to exercise dominion over his brethren, feeling that he is invested with authority to make his will the ruling power, the best and only safe course is to remove him, lest great harm be done, and he lose his own soul and imperil the soul of others. All your brethren, this disposition to lord it over God's heritage will cause a reaction. It's coming. Unless these men change their course, those in authority should manifest the Spirit of Christ. They should deal as He would deal with every case that requires attention. They should go weighted with the Holy Spirit. A man's position does not make him one jot or tittle greater in the sight of God. It is character alone that God values. Brethren, for the sake of the souls, for the sake of Charles Tapp, he needs to be removed. That's what she says. That's what the Spirit of Prophecy says. Tapp needs to be removed. Ted Wilson needs to be removed. Gnub Diop needs to be removed. The one who sh shakes hands with the Pope. These men need to be removed for their salvation's sake. This isn't vengeance. This isn't anger. This is their salvation. Do you care about Ted Wilson? Do you care about Charles Tapp? Do you care about Danub Gen Diop? then they need to be removed. If, if, if there are people there in our church structure that have the power to do these things, if you love them, if you really love them, you will take Ellen White's advice and have these men removed and install people who are righteous and who will do the work. If you do not do this, if there are those in power right now that do not do this, you do not love God, you do not love these men because they will be lost. They'll, be, they'll think that they can just continue on without being rebuked and they're going to lose their soul. And there's going to be souls that, that follow them that are also going to be lost. This is a salvation of souls. This is serious business. This is serious business. The salvation of the souls of these men. I don't want to see these men lost. I don't want to see, I don't want to see Ted Wilson lost. I want to see him in heaven. I want to see Charles Tapp in heaven. I want to see these men in heaven. I want to... I want to Give them a hug and say, brother, I'm so glad to see you. But if, if they are allowed to continue this madness, they will not repent because they think they'll be above all law, even God's. A reaction is coming in the church. And that reaction, I believe, is going to be the shaking. It's part of it. It's going to cause a shaking. The true message, the straight testimony of the Laodiceans is going to sweep through the church. The Holy Spirit, by his unction, is going to raise up men that are going to speak against this evil. The Holy Spirit isn't going to, God isn't going to bring down angels to suddenly appear in our churches. He's going to give the Spirit to men. God is giving his Spirit to men throughout the world. He's preparing men throughout the whole world, throughout his church right now, 
to take the place of those that are going to be replaced. God is prepping their spirit. God is working on their heart to soften their heart, to see what the errors are, are and not repeat them. God is bringing people under the unction and power of the Holy Spirit, under His direction, under His teaching, in His school, the school of Jesus Christ. Not the seminary. Not our universities, which are almost wholly given over to LGBTQ, learning perversion. God is giving His Spirit to men who are willing to do and die. Who are willing to lay it on the line. And who will not be turned from their purpose that God has put into their hearts. And God is calling all men, all of His Christian Seventh-day Adventist men. He's calling you right now to stand firm to restore the truth and righteousness in your own heart, to let the gospel into your heart, let it come into your families, order yourselves and prepare yourselves to be called. You're about to be called. God is about to call. I don't know where you are. I don't know who you are. But God is about to call and prepare you for the work because he's going to end it. This world has to end. The wickedness that Christ is dealing with every day in the heavenly sanctuary, it must end. And it's going to end. And God is going to move upon His Spirit. God is going to use His Spirit to move upon His people, His men, to stand. Yes, men. To stand between the porch and the altar. To stand as Moses stood and prayed, O oh God, spare your people, and if not, then don't spare me either. That's the love that's necessary. That is the love that is necessary to be a minister. It's impossible in human terms. It's only as a man takes on Jesus Christ. That is a minister. Potomac Conference, you want to know how to, how to rule people? Look at Moses. You look at Moses. You're not like Moses. You're like Eli. You're like Dathan. But you're not like Moses. You need to be like Moses. The goodness, mercy, and love of God were proclaimed by Christ to Moses. This was God's character. When men who profess to serve God ignore his parental character and depart from honor and righteousness in dealing with their fellow men, Satan exults, for he has inspired them with his attributes. They are following the track of Romanism. What's happening now, brethren, is Romanism. The GC signing documents, the Potomac Conference, Romanism, papistry, papists. That's what this is. It's the spirit of Antichrist. It's the spirit of Antichrist. You're following your father, the devil. Do you understand? You are in danger. You're in spiritual danger. Be like Moses. Be like Moses. When the people rose up to stone him, he didn't call down fire from heaven. He bowed his head to God and God dealt with it. Be like Moses, brethren. You're not gods. You're not Pharaoh. Be like Moses. Romanism is the spirit of Antichrist. This is man-made gods. In another 
portion for selected messages. 122, Ellen White writes this. We have far more to fear from within than from without. The hindrance to strength and success are far greater from the church itself than from the world. Unbelievers have a right to expect that those who profess to be keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus who will do more, will do more than any other class to promote and honor by their consistent lives, by their godly example, their active influence, the cause which they represent. But how often have the professed advocates of the truth provided, proved the greatest obstacles to its advancement? The unbelief indulged, the doubts expressed, the darkness cherished, encouraged the presence of evil angels and opened the way for the accomplishment of Satan's devices. Do you want to accomplish Satan's device or do you want to accomplish God's will? Do you want to be men made gods or do you want to be men approved of God? Do you want to be Pharaoh or do you want to be Moses? Do you want to be like Jesus, who approved of Moses? Or do you want to be like Pharaoh and face his fate? It's your choice. The world is fast approaching the end point. And the gospel is going to be preached with power throughout all the world. But it will be preached by pure people. It will be preached by people who have given their lives to Jesus, who have submitted themselves to him. Not necessarily that have come from the institutions of learning that we have. God is going to speak, and he's going to speak with power. Brethren, what do we do? This is what she says. Do we individually realize our true position? That as God's hired servants, we are not to bargain away our stewardship. Every one of us out there, every Seventh Avenue out there, you are, you are a steward. God has made you a steward of something. You have a talent, or maybe more that God is about to use to preach the gospel, to spread the truth. We have an individual accountability before the heavenly universe to administer the trust committed to us of God. It is not enough to rest in pastors. It is not enough to rest in what the pastor is doing and to listen to the pastor. That is not enough. If the pastor speaks the word of God, then well, listen. If he does not, then ignore it. Ignore it. Because it's not God's word. Our hands are to have something to impart. Our own hearts are to be stirred. Individually, as members of the church, you have something to do. You have something to do with what's going on in the church right now. There is a, there is a place that God wants you to be in. Our hands are to have something to impart of the income that God entrusts to us. The humblest of us may be agents for God, using our gifts for his name's glory. He who improves his talents to the best of his ability may present to God his offering as a consecrated gift that shall be as a fragrant incense before him. It is the duty of everyone to see that his talents are turned to advantage as a gift that he must return, having done his best to improve it. That's what we do. Go to work for Jesus in whatever capacity. Don't wait for permission from councils, from conferences, from pastors, from church. Don't wait for permission. God gives you permission. You have the Bible before you. You have the spirit of prophecy with you. Get down on your knees and pray. Say, Lord, what is your work? And for now, if he wants you to be a carpenter, be a carpenter. But if you're going to be a carpenter, be like Jesus was one. Or a plumber. Or a lawyer. Whatever it is. He may call you into more open ministry. He may ask you to set down your your band, your 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 saw and your drill. Pick up the Bible and minister. He may call you as a minister. But don't wait. Don't let conferences tell you you can't do this and you can't do that. You can't preach the gospel. Only do it according to our way. That is not God's way. That is not from God. The conferences are there to support the gospel, not prevent the gospel. The conferences are there to prevent Evil, not support evil. Friends, you can know about the Sunday law in 1844 and the state of the dead and which day is the true Sabbath day. But if you're acting like a man-made God, you have the spirit of Antichrist in you. 
you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. You're not going to see Jesus in peace. As lay members, we have a duty to support those who are in authority. I'm not about rebelling against proper church authority. But proper church authority has to be proper church authority. If you start becoming like the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and Sadducees of Jesus' day, then like Peter, I'll tell you, it is better to follow God than men. Friends, the church is going to be shaken mightily and we are, we are not going to be saved in groups. We are saved individually. We're not going to stand in groups. We're going to stand individually. Individually, we have a responsibility before God to stand and do what's right. And this is my prayer that you would pray and ask God, Lord, what is it that you want me to do in the setting that I'm in? It's time to stand in the churches. It's time to prepare because they will confiscate your goods. And I would advise churches to see about not allowing the conference to own everything that you have. Because conferences, if they're going to follow the pattern, are going to start turning things over. They're going to start confiscating materials. When whole conferences are forbidden from speaking about certain things, you know that something's up in that conference. And I wouldn't trust it. Mm -mm. It's time to prepare. Laity, it's time to prepare. Time to prepare the ability to have a house church. Time to prepare to worship outside of the church building. Think the, do you think we're going to be allowed to keep these things in a no-buy, no-sell scenario? Already now, you've got conferences confiscating material, goods, and monies, as it appears. So, prepare, brethren. Prepare. Remember what the Bible says? Believe in the Lord your God, so shall it be established. Believe in His prophets, so shall you prosper. My prayer is that the laity out there prepare themselves. Let the pastorate out there humble themselves. And that together we can walk the road to Christ. Together we can walk with Jesus. We don't need to be openly hostile. There needs to be no hostilities. But there needs to be repentance. And there needs to be a change. And God is going to bring that change but we have to be ready for it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, these are solemn times. Solemn times. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would so move among your people that there would be a spirit of repentance, of mutual brotherly love, of kindness and hope towards each other. That we would submit to one another and submit to you. That there would be proper church authority and that there would be a purification from all perversion and evil. Help us, Lord. God, help us. We are in your hands. Have mercy on your people, O God. As we come to your throne, wash us in your blood. Cleanse us by your, your, your blood. Let the Holy Spirit fill us with new thoughts, new desires, with a humble heart to go forth to preach the gospel. God, help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, friends, for spending time with me today. Please remember to share, a like, a comment. And, you know, this ministry is self-supporting. And I appreciate all those that have supported us thus far. Truly, you have helped us to keep the lights on. And I pray that uh, we would be able to continue to grow in that area because we do want to have a place to worship. We do want to eventually be able to open up a little place to worship locally. How that's going to happen, I don't know. But if you could pray for that for us, we would appreciate it. Pray for that for this ministry, for, for Profit from Profit Ministries. We would appreciate it. Appreciate all my listeners. God bless. Take care. And we will see you again soon. Bye now.